than any other people in this land. First quote, Simeon Bass, ex-chair of the Management Committee of Baysdorf. Second quote, Patriarch Gideon Bass. We are more South African than any other. And then another Baysdorf resident. Eerst was ons niet wit genoeg nie. Nou is ons niet zwart genoeg nie. First we weren't white enough, now we're not black enough. Much of this revolves around one single individual. Okay, we've got a little glitch here. And I'm going to share this in detail with you. This is a foreword to this book by Sarah G Gertrude Millen, in her day regarded as a celebrated author. And she called it King of the Bastards, 1950. The foreword was written by Field Marshal, later Premier, Jan Christian Smuts. The tragedy of color which is South Africa stands revealed for all to see it. The story is ostensibly the history of the origins of a very small colored or half-breed community in South Africa. The base family in the Northern Transvaal, descendants of one white man, Kunrad Bais, and his harem of native women. But in reality, it is much more. It is in the first place the story of Kunrad Bais itself and of his progress like a demagogue through the welter of confusion which reigned in South Africa in the latter part of the 18th and 19th centuries. And in the second place, we get a picture of South African horror such as has never been painted before. And it is painted around the gigantic figure of this Kunrat base. Just a few references to him before we start at the beginning, begin at the beginning. He has been called many things, and I have a few examples. The slide will follow a little later. Kunrad de Base, desperado, scoundrel, vagabond, adventurer, elephant hunter, farmer, outlaw, cattle rustler, revolutionary, confidante, Advisor, pioneer, believer, Kunrad Bais, Kunrad de Bais. In 1688, arrived here in Cape Town, a ship, and aboard was one Jean. De Bois, from Calais in France, wine farmer in France, and he came with the French Huguenots, settled here in Cape Town, eventually also started wine farming. Thank you, Jean, for bringing wine to this country, amongst others. Married a French woman, who also, I don't know whether she came over then or came later. And I mentioned some of this in the previous discussion that we had. Yeah, they had children. But the son, incidentally afterwards, he won't look, and I put this on the slide as well. I have the genealogy here of where it all started. The blue, there's Ron, and eventually Kunrad in the red. You'll see it on the slide. He had a son, Jean had a son, Jean, who became Jan. De Bois became De Beis, and eventually De Beis became Beis. Grand, great grandson of Jean de Bois, Kunrad de Beis, this person that we're now uh, referring to. 
That's three, in fact, it's 330 some years ago, not 320 years ago, that's when that happened. 200 years later, the son of this Kunrad base, Kunrad the base, led a delegation to Pretoria from up in the Sotpensberg to Paul Kruger. And what they had discussed or wanted to discuss was land. And eventually, the president of the Transvaal Republic at that time, Paul Kruger, Paul Kreer, gave them land up in the Sotpensberg, uh, quote, for services rendered to the Republic. Services rendered um, in skirmishes with the local tribes, as they called them. The base people would act as guides, or achterreiers, as they called it then, assistants, um, et cetera, et cetera. In basic terms, they were on the side of the Boers or the white pioneers of that area at that time. And in terms of saying thank you, Paul Creer said, here we are, here's some land for you up in the Sotbrunsburg. You can look at that now. Um, Kunrad the base is now generally regarded as the progenitor of the base community, the base, base clan, if you like. The top you can see in blue, Jean de Bois and his wife, and then his son, and his son, and then eventually in red, this now famous or infamous person, Kunrad the base. Today in Beisdorp, uh, a small community, and we'll get, get back to more detail in terms of this, Base door, base town, this little settlement, if you like. Uh, there is a graveyard, uh, a cemetery, amongst other things. And the oldest headstone, discernible inscriptions on the oldest headstone, refers to one Alexander the base. Now, this Alexander is the first and, and oldest in terms of sequence person ever buried in this settlement. And he was the tow layer of the oxen that took the wagon down to Paul Creer in 1888 to discuss this land issue. So there's the first almost tangible connection with the early basis, with Jean de Bois, if you like, with France, if you like, buried in the cemetery, the graveyard there. You can see uh, just little inserts, uh, old gravestones on the left, and the inscription here, which says, Kunrad Beis, een vrede forst, en een voorbeeld van langmoedigheid. Uh, how does that, uh, early Dutch, it, uh, how does that translate? A powerful presence, a powerful person, but also one seeking peace and one of a fairly calm and sedate sort of personality. And this says something about this figure that looms so large in South Africa's history that in, during the previous dispensation, and you can uh, argue this point if you've been in, at school all those years, sorry, years ago, not all those years ago in South Africa, we can argue the point to the extent he was so formidable and so truly rainbow South African in terms of cohabiting and uh, befriending and even formally marrying so many of the local people that he was written out of our history books. Did any of you ever in South Africa see a history book where Kunrad de Beis figures prominently? He was written out. It was an uncomfortable person to put into the early history books. But even now, where every, the playing field seems to or supposed to be level, how much do you read about Kunrad de Beis? I'll get back to what, has, what is being written about him a little later. Formidable man, he had this incredible presence. That's just a sketch, incidentally, just before that, that is an actual uh, 
copy of his handwriting, his signature. He bought farms and didn't buy farms, stole farms, stole property, cattle, and all sorts of things. But he did sign a few documents, formal documents, and that is his actual, actual handwriting. And the artist uh, tried to depict him in that sort of way. I think that's fairly accurate if you look at the descriptions uh, and depictions of missionaries and early people who met him. And let's just have a look. And again, there's a lot of detail, but I think we must share this before we just look at the main issues at hand. He was a, the forerunner of a new type of South African, a stoically brave, fanatically independent tracker, with his childlike faith in God's word. But like all new types, he possessed the traits of his successes in a more marked, a more crude degree. In him, bravery was reckless daring, independence was lawlessness, and his religion was a mass of inconsistencies. His uncommon height, everybody who met him was absolutely impressed. He was in the old terms much more than two meters, in the old terms much more than, slightly more than seven foot two. He was a big man. But this nice English word, he had this mien, M-I-E-N, had this quiet presence when he walked into a space. Yet admirable proportion of his limbs. This is a missionary looking at this physical shape. I mean, there's one male describing the other male with admirable the proportion of his limbs. His excellent carriage, his firm countenance, high for it, his whole mien, and a certain dignity in his movements made altogether a most pleasing impression. Such one might conceive to have been the heroes of ancient times. He seemed to be the living figure of Hercules. This is often quoted, that little passage is often quoted. The terror of his enemies, the hope and support of his friends, we found in him a certain modesty, a certain retiredness in his manner and conversation, a mildness and a kindness in his looks and mien, which left no room to suspect that he had lived years among savages. This is Liechtenstein writing in the 1800s, uh, 1804, I think that particular passage was. Kunrat de Beis. I constructed this, this map, um, and we're not, it'll take a very long time. This has some indication of his spatial, his geographical meanderings, not only, and his activities, and his influence all over South and Southern Africa, in fact. Just look at that very carefully. I've got a lot of text on this for the detail. Incidentally, somebody asked me, what about my notes? She said my notes. Uh, if you want more detail, like the text that I'm using here, just for, for your information in hard copy, please just write to me and we can arrange that you have this sort of information. You'll see now how much there is. We just don't have time in this sort of hour. And I, after yesterday going on and on and on, I need to watch, uh, watch my time a little bit here. Right, number one, you can see the number one. It says Kochmans Kloof, that's a farm. And that's a farm near Montague. That is where Kunrad the base was born in 1761. And then he was baptized, and we moved to, here we are, back in Cape Town, number two. Kunrad the base was even here. Here he was baptized in Cape Town in 1772. Then he went out to Swellendam, where he was a foreman for his sister and his uh, brother-in-law. But they argued over uh, butter. They had an argument over a butter, and he, they nearly uh, physically assaulted each other, the brother-in-law and the Kunrat, uh, just as well for the brother-in-law that they didn't end up fighting. And he left. There was bad blood between him and that member of his family. 1784, Graf Renet. There he was illegally um, bartering with the Cossa, illegally in terms of the local magistrate. He clashed with this magistrate, Meynier, in Graf Renet. 1795, he was, it was in a British uh, presence, government administration here in Cape Town. Uh, he was anti-British. He actually mobilized people in an anti-British sort, of, uh, uh, sort of way. 17, no, six years later, or for the next six years, in fact, he became a vagabond. He moved all over the country. Many of those marks that I have there indicate where he was and what he was doing. Uh, he befriended, though, also van der Kemp, the missionary, and acted in a very positive way. He acted as interpreter, he acted as go-between with the Kosa people. He had a good um, relationship, incidentally, with those people. 
We went off to the Tarka when things got a little bit too uncomfortable, too hot for him in what is now, what was Transkai, the Eastern Cape, that area. So he went out to Tarkastat. I don't know if you know where Tarkastat is. It's almost in the middle of nowhere. Nice little village. Um, 1803, the Batavian Republic came and took over again here at, at, uh, at Cape Town. And on behalf of Governor Janssens, he acted as negotiator, also in a much more uh, positive sort of frame. That same year, he moved to another farm, this time in the Longkloof. I haven't quite found the exact uh, place in the Longkloof, this farm. He farmed there for a while. And then also got in a bit of trouble, and by 1815 he had to move on again. He went right to the north into, you remember, Grikwa area near Kimberley, and Grik, what is now Grikwa town. And he actually led a, a bunch of marauders, Griqua people, and this is where they did a little bit of cattle rustling and gun running and all that, that sort of thing. But he also um, befriended the local chiefs, black, black communities, as they were called, it's a little not kosher anymore, the tribes in that area. Amongst others, the Khananwa, they on Bloberg, anybody who's traveled north towards the uh, little town of Vivo, will pass a very uh, dramatic, a very uh, imposing mountain on the left. It's called Blauberg, Blauberg, Blue Mountain. On top of that mountain lives an entire community of Khananwa, even now, with their chief. He befriended them and became a chief of a black community in his own right, did Kunrad the base. They even gave him a name, Kadisha, name of respect, Kadisha. Many of them also, along this old trail that I'm talking, he got the name Mora. He used to get up not in a very good mood and walk around, start uh, sort of uh, the fire again to make his early morning coffee. But if he encountered anybody, he'd walk, the very tall man would sort of walk around in this early morning bad mood. Mora, Mora, Mora. So his name was also Mora. Morning, good morning. Not so good, but morning. Uh, Kadisha, amongst the Khananwa. Eighteen twenty-five. Just five years after the eighteen twenty settlers also arrived here. Things were happening in Southern Africa at that stage. Only to have been an anthropologist to be moving around, seeing all these new people coming in, all this dynamic in this part of the the continent would have been. Wonderful. For the first time now, he and his sons, particularly Michael or Michael, Gabriel, uh, and Doris, Doris, D-O-R-I-S, moved up into what is the Sopansburg area. You remember when they got the land only in 1888 by virtue of his son, Michael, Michael, who went down to Paul Kruger in Oxwagon. But this is the first time they moved into that area, 1825. He was fairly ill at this stage. He had a problem with one of his legs. He had an encounter with uh, some kind of animal in the bush at one stage, uh, and he wasn't well. And his wife then, Elizabeth, and we'll go into his marriages and cohabitations just now, uh, had also died of fever. Not sure what kind of fever, maybe malaria in that area. And he wasn't in a very good frame. And he asked these three sons and their families to accompany him to the Limpopo River, in the Limpopo Bags, and he said to them, you wait here for me, because already he had other plans. The entire South Africa as it is now is just getting a little bit too uncomfortable for him, and obviously he wasn't physically very well either at that stage. But he was already thinking of other opportunities further north, beyond the Limpopo. And he said, wait here, I'm going to look for other opportunities, and crossed the river, and he never came back. There are a few theories about this. Maybe also a fever, malaria. Maybe a lion got hold of Kunrat eventually. Would have been a nice symbolic sort of end, I suppose, for such an incredible figure. But there's also a third theory, which I like, that he ended up in the Portuguese side, Sofala. Went right across to Sofala and started another community. And now you have not base anymore. How would you pronounce base in Portuguese? Now you have a base community. He married a, 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 a Portuguese-speaking woman and established another community there. Incidentally, these bases, 
such places you find in Namibia, there's a community of them. You drive through a little village like Coffee Fontaine in the middle of the Free State. And every time my wife's so irritated by this, when somebody says, Can I, what would you like? I say, Un unleaded petrol, fill it up, please. And he comes back and I say, what's your name? And he'll say, Pete, now I'll say, what's your surname? And if somebody's discussed Malchas here, just now. Malchas, why Malchas? Where do your people come from? <laughs> Discover the base community at Coffee Fontaine. These bases. Not just a base, but you also find white bases, and they claim they actually accentuate that. In Somerset East, very prominent farmers are base, base farmers, but they came directly from Holland. They were bases in Holland as well, so don't get confused. <laughs> I also have a, a colleague in anthropology, a female, and she's, she's a base, but a B-U-I-J-S base. And she says, although she's an anthropologist, I'm of these other bases. <laughs> Don't. Base is not just base. No. All right, as I said, he married and cohabited uh, with people all over. First, um, what happened to the first son? Married a Maria van der Horst. Euphemistically, in those days, such a female partner would have been called. He had a, had a Frau, Frau van der Kaap. And a woman from the Cape. In other words, not quite kosher in terms of what the Dutch people at that stage wanted. In practice, it was for all of them virtually different, but officially, this is not quite the thing that you should be doing. So he moved off his time in uh, what is now or was the Transkei Eastern Great Corsa speaking area. There he married the young chief Ngrika. Some mystery books used to say Gaika, Grika, very prominent, very powerful young chief, married his mother, that Kunrad. And then, as he moved on into Zulu-speaking area, guess what? The famous or infamous, but certainly powerful, and, and uh, what a force in Southern Africa, Mslekatsi, Selkats, some history books were, Mslekatsi's niece. Some sources even say sister of the Zulu chief he married. Some of these uh, unions or arrangements uh, he actually formalized. He would go, he actually traveled all the way back to Swellendam at one stage and had a formal stamp put on this union. And this I can't find out why. Ms. Lekatsi's niece or sister, his now wife, was called Elizabeth. Not a very uh, well-known Zulu word, you know. <laughs> But she was known as Elizabeth, and she died of a fever uh, when they moved into the South Ponsberg area. But from this union, um, nine recorded offspring uh, came. And three of them are mentioned, Michael, uh, or Michal, Gideon, and Doris. And they had a, a very, very influential role to play in, in that part of what is now the far northern Limpopo province. And this Michael, as I said, uh, led this delegation down to, to Paul Cree in Pretoria, 1888. And just a month later, he died after now uh, securing the land for the bases in that uh, neck of the woods. He was also instrumental. I think it was in 1863, before this delegation went down, to uh, organize, arrange for Alexander McKidd, a Scottish minister, to come out and minister to the bases. And that's when he uh, started reading the Bible and thought he should change his ways, which more or less was similar to that of his father, Kunrat. Amongst other things, he had to then uh, get rid of 24 wives and uh, concubines and so on. <coughs> To, according to his, the Bible he was now reading, he should only retain one, and he kept the one, he kept the one wife. There's actually a picture in the museum of this, this Michal, I'll show you just now. Um, so, and Makid came, ministered to them, but first his wife and he, he also got the fever there. It was a, a very wild and woolly sort of area uh, in terms of the environment, but also in terms of skirmishes and aggression from some of the local communities. Followed, McKid was one Hofmeyer, 
missionary, this entire book write, written about him and by him. He wrote lots of, lots of things, kept meticulous record, which is wonderful for historians and particularly also for anthropologists. And Hofmeyer ministered to the base of people for more than 40 years. He lived there and, and did some wonderful missionary type, type of work. Um, just a little aside, these skirmishes and the animosity with the local people uh, was sporadic. All, even Gabriel in his own right at one stage got, got into a bit of a, when they'd moved out of base or because of the problem there, they moved south um, and they were followed and attacked by one of um, Ms. Lekazi's units. And they, they ended up, Gabriel and his family and, and his, his, the other members of his group ended up on top of a hill, uh, just a few kilometers, literally just four or five kilometers north on the old tar road, north of what used to be called Warmbad, warm bars, it's now Bella Bella. Bella Bella incidentally means warm water. And when it was Warmbad, the, the black township was called Bella Bella. Now the town is called Bella Bella. I don't know whether the township's now called Varambat. I don't know whether, <laughs> whether they've changed that around a bit. Uh, so they were chased up on this hill and surrounded by these, these warriors with their assegais and spears. And they just sat there waiting for them to now run out of water, obviously, and stuff. And went into the second and third day and they had some water, the Gabriel and his clan, in these skin bags that they had in the ox wagons and so on third, fourth day, but then it was really getting tight. So he got all the men together behind what little scrub bush there was and uh, took all these empty, now empty bags and got them to donate from their person liquid in these bags. And he filled about seven of these bags to capacity, took them by those little string handles and then walked to the edge of this hill and shouted down at them and said, you guys think you're going to stay there long enough for us to run out of water? We got plenty of water. Look at this. And he emptied them. Water, 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 water. What our short story was, they, they packed up and they went off. And uh, Gabriel and his clan could go down, came down and went back to where they wanted to be. Today it's called base corp. All right, I said Hofmeyer, 40 years, uh, and this Michael died when he was 76 years old after managing to, to get them this wonderful piece of land. Let's just page through some of, some of this. This is the kind of text I say, it's very detailed because it has to be fairly complete to make any sense, but if you're interested at a later stage to have the, the detail, we can arrange. There's just not time in an hour to do that sort of thing here. I've gone through, in essence, the, the main points of these things. Uh, there's the, the photograph now in a museum at uh, old little foot tracker um, um, uh, reconstructed village just outside of Lutrichard or Mercado, and that's Alexander McKid, the missionary. Another little angle to the base uh, saga, if you like, was the Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1902. The British set up what eventually became known as concentration camps and thousands of people died, uh, particularly females and children and older men who were also in those camps. And because of what I said earlier, the sentiment that the base had on behalf of or on the side of the Boers, particularly in this war as well, they act, acted as, as um, um, spies, if you like, or intelligence individuals to, to establish where people were or to lead them on a particular track or to track other people or just generally to assist the Boers. And for that reason, the British eventually also closed down basically that old town and said, you're all coming with us. They were never active, officially or formally active in the war in the sense of carrying arms and fighting the British. So they took that whole community, basically closed, closed down the community and said, you're also coming into a concentration camp. And this camp was just on the outskirts of what used to be called Petersburg, Polokwane. 
It's now, Petersburg is now caught up with the camp. It's right up. The industrial area is virtually around this concentration camp. And you can see the list of names. And there are many, many, many of them there. And some of these youngsters, look at this. A female child, only two months old, died there. And a significant number of bases died in the concentration camp on behalf of the cause of which they weren't really active in the real sense of, of the word. Interesting little comment on the, this British concentration camp and the bases. They put them in there, but didn't give them tents like the, the Boer women and children and older men. They said, you, you're in this camp, but you go in that corner. You're not allowed to be part of this. There was apartheid within a British form of apartheid. They said, you have to be separate, and you look after your accommodation. We're not giving you tents or anything like that. You stay there. So for the duration of the war till 1902, the base people were in this particular concentration camp. That's the cemetery, uh, uh, just more or less where the camp was. The camp was, I think, just a few hundred meters, uh, not in this particular spot that we see in front of us. OK, now the location. You can see at the bottom here, that's Petersburg or Polokwane. Then you move to the top there. Uh, you can see base door, but slightly shaded. Just below that, it says Mara, which incidentally is the name of the, the first and most important farm. On the other map, you can see four words or names for farms. It's Mara, Beisuk, Beisplas, and Beisdorp. Mara, because of the biblical connotation of place of bitterness, place of hardship, they called it Mara. Now, Beisdorp is situated just there. It's, if you look at the map, Vivo, and Lutrichard or Mercado. It's almost halfway between, between the two. You can see Lutrichard over there. I keep saying Lutrichard Mercado because the local government uh, wanted to change the name to Mercado. He was a, a prominent uh, chief at the time in the local area, but he, he attacked and killed indiscriminately even some of the other local so-called tribes and not only the whites. And so a lot of the other people in that community said, we don't want Mercado. And they hadn't followed the pro pro process anyway, so they changed it back to Lutrichard. And then the local authority took another initiative, and it was Mercado again. And uh, I think as I speak now, it's back to Lutrichard. So I have to keep saying, otherwise you wouldn't know. One minister came up to, to give a very, uh, not, not long ago, very official and important speech. And he's sitting in the back, his driver in the front, and saying, for some reason, he didn't know how to get exactly to this place. He said, uh, stop next to the road, he said, I, I need to take this minister to Mercado, he's to have a speech. First, they explained, explained, they went through the tunnel, through the South Pondsburg, out the other end. There's a little village, Mercado, beyond the South Pondsburg, and that's where the minister ended up. So even the Mercado was, could not be found by the by the minister of the government who supported this cause for changing the name. You should have asked for Lutrichard, they would have known. <coughs> Beisdorp, that gives a good impression. At the top, just, uh, well, Beisdorp, base town. That, when you walk into, drive into Beisdorp, you don't see houses. You might see one structure and then there's a lot of vegetation and then you see another house. It's, it's got this very rural, very, uh, uh, actually, a very beautiful sort of thing. You see on the left there, part of the Sotbonsberg, and some land's been worked in the front. On the right is the base door post office. Makes, it's only open on certain days for certain hours. It was closed for quite a while. And on some advice from some of us who happened to come there, they now keep postcards uh, available and stamps. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful adventurous sort of thing to be able to send a postcard to Amsterdam from base door post office and people do that when they come there. In the middle is the church, uh, on the left is the community hall, Gemeenschapssaal, guess what it's called? Paul Krier Gemeenschapssaal. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. And another sort of more rural uh, sitting on the right. Three shops, the metropolis, uh, on the left, and on the right and the right bottom, the middle is the school. Left bottom is the clinic. It's just a house that used to serve as a clinic. Used to because 
uh, they had problems there, a, a, a black mamba bit the 14-year-old son of a woman who was waiting there, and, and he died of that, so they moved out of the house, it fell into disuse, and with some money that we were able to, to um, facilitate, they've now got a, a proper building a clinic that was built there, and that's where they meet on a monthly basis uh, from very early in the morning. Jasper on the right bottom, excuse the personal sort of uh, a touch there, that's in the clinic now. From five o'clock they arrive at the clinic and, they, and you get a number, otherwise you wait for seven, eight hours uh, and they're chronically ill people in there waiting for their medic medication which they can only get from this mobile clinic who stops at this, this building now. And they arrive there and these people had been waiting for all those hours and just wanting their medicine, say, sorry, we, we forgot to bring the pr proper medicine or we're out of stock or something like that. And then these chronically ill people have to wait for two months and hope that next time they come that possibly that to experience this proper, I, I think I might have mentioned what we as anthropologists do in terms of our fieldwork techniques or methodology is participant observation. We try to become part of a society or a community and from inside as it were. So I also stood in the queue. You see I had number 21, so I wasn't there at five o'clock. I got a later number. Still had to wait two, three, four hours. First there's a standing queue and then you, you uh, you go um, graduate to a sitting down queue and then you go into a passage where you sit behind each other like in a coach for the third version of the same queue and eventually you're allowed into an office where people then, then uh, ask you what, what do you want, what is wrong with you and they, they asked me and I said I'm stressed. <laughs> uh, I really need some tranquilizer or something, I'm stressed you know by what I'd heard, because in that sort of situation, people chat, you know, as people do. They just chat to each other, they might not necessarily to me, and you hear all the gossip and all the real stories without eliciting information. When you ask people a question, they sometimes, often, want to give you the answer that they think you want. But if you just, the ebb and flow of normal conversation, you get excellent info. So I was stressed by what I'd experienced, and I was stressed by what I'd heard. So they gave me a, a little something to calm me down. Not a tot of brand, brandy I had to get later. Um, so just this very important emphasis on religion and uh, this person, Simeon Bass, his father is one of those, it's very indistinct, it's the only photograph available. Uh, his name was Daniel and he was an early preacher for the Bass people. And that picture they took in front of the church when it was set up. So this genealogy goes a long, long way down. This Simeon, incidentally, if you look at the, the genealogical diagram that I made, starting with Jean de Boer through Conrad de Bays, going all the way down, uh, and this has not been extended. With the help of my graduate students, we've taken this. I can, I can spread this the length of this and, and all the way back. But we've now incorporated all the living, existing bases into this. And Simeon is a direct descendant of Kunrat de Bays and Jean de Boer, and very proudly so now that he knows exactly where he comes from. Which reminds me, my cell phone's on as well. I haven't switched it off. Luckily, nobody's phone. The people, Susan on the right bottom, she's also died of, of um, heart failure. Uh, some children at the school some old friends from Bastol. Now, this land is situated on the Serakalala River, and it's 11,000 hectares, those four farms that I mentioned, and I actually have the documentation, which I'll show you tomorrow, affirming that in perpetuity, given by King Edward VI to them, this land belongs to them. But Sarakalala is not just coincidental. That river is named for a chief that used to uh, be there and, and rule over a community of Sarakalala people. And their land claims against them, against the base people. And they, I did some land claims research in that area. And they're contesting the claim, of course. One, because they've got an official document saying this is legitimately their land. But the more powerful reason is who are you claiming intending to claim the land from? The base people 
or from the local people because of intermarriage to the extent the sons of Kunra the base all married local females, meaning Venda and Sutu speaking people. And we read that into their genetics. They're indigenous, they're local. As I said, they, they, they're more rainbow than anybody else, as they also say in this country. So who's claiming from whom? We are here already. We are the vendor amongst other things, amongst many other things, <laughs> but this is our land. So this is causing quite a lot of stress. There's also Wurblut, uh, hypertension, high blood. They talk about Wurblut, hypertension. And there's also Saker, sugar, diabetes. And I've got a master's student now working there. She's finishing off her MA, hopefully uh, by June. And she's found, we found that the, the, the incidence of these two um, problems, diseases, if you like, is much higher in the base door community than in the surrounding areas. Big problems. And stress because of the land claims. Other kinds of stress also impinge on that. That little photograph, uh, aerial photograph, shows green patches of land. It's actually quite quite dated, it's about eight or 10 years old. You take one now, there's no green. They're not tilling the soil. They had, every single base had a garden before. They grew vegetable of their own. And maybe that's another reason of what we're talking about. Now they, they go to Vivo and they buy all the canned stuff, all this, this processed food, and they don't eat the fresh uh, home-grown uh, vegetables anymore. Uh, there are about 300 to 350 de facto residents in Baystorp. In di diaspora or diaspora, there are thousands of bases all over the place, as I mentioned before, particularly in Lutrichard working there or because the children after what used to be standard seven have to go out of Baystorp to go get schooling um, and working in Johannesburg uh, and so on. But if you're there and if you want a plot, you get one that's about 100 meters by 200 meters where you can build your house, provided you're a base, descendant from a base, or married to a base and over 18 years old. And then you can build your house. And then you have access to communal grazing in those 11,000, not all of the 11,000. One of those farms they let out to a white farmer for income for their trust, for their own uh, finances, as it were. They've got a, uh, their own autonomous management system. They've got a management committee, a chair, all males, all males. Uh, Simeon Base and Gideon Base, all different chairs over the years that I've been involved there. And then they've almost got like a Senate, Senate, like a House of Elders, that uh, a management committee. And then they've got a family uh, committee. It's three levels of government, and they manage their own affairs. Reticulation of water comes from two fountains out in the South Pondsburg. They built, built ditches, and eventually pipes were set up all self-financed, the roads they look after themselves. They give hunting permits if somebody wants to hunt. They control that. Then came 1994 and the general election, and suddenly they're part of Bacardo, Lutrichard, municipal, greater municipal area in the Vehembe district, and they're in Ward 1. And they now had to vote for representatives, but they said, we, we represent ourselves. This is our land. We are autonomous. They said, no. You're now in Ward 1 of Mercado. You have to go and vote with 5,000 other eligible voters, including the black township of Mercado and the part of the white town of uh, Lutrichard, including uh, Vivo, the little town, and some rural settlements there. And eventually, two representatives were voted for them for Ward 1, and none of them they want because they were voted in by another party and not by themselves. So this is causing a lot of stress. Uh, they don't want the municipality in, and there are factions within the base that bring in the municipality. They have these graders, they'll fix our roads, they'll do all these wonderful things for us. But they say, once they do it, then they'll say, we now control your farm. They call the place d -plus. This is our farm. This is our place. Okay, I've discussed this management. There's Sibion Base again, the management committee. Oh. Very interesting, just this one thing I mentioned. If you stay permanently now on base door, and you want your 100 by 200 meters plot of land, you have to pay tax every year. You have to pay to live there. It costs you per year, this year, 2017, 60 rand, 60. If you're outside in Joburg and you want to retain access to your plot, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. It's gonna 
cost you twice as much, 120 rand a year to keep that plot and have access to your plot and build your house. Every time I come there, they always first have a committee meeting and the chair like Simeon Bayes would stand up and say, oh, this is what we'll discuss today, but a very special word of welcome to Professor De Jong. You know, he comes so often, he's, he's so friendly, he's done so much for us. He's actually like family now. And when my turn comes, I say, Simeon, Mr. Bayes, thank you very much for this welcome. And this and this and this is what we've done and we're planning and thank you for your cooperation. But just one little matter, seeing it on our family, I'd like my plot. <laughs> Honorary base. And I'll pay my 120 rand, build my house up in the mountain. That's still that uh, organizing. We managed to facilitate other monies. On the left top is a classroom. The United Nations Women's League. I actually went to Geneva and, and sold this story, if you like marketed this, this need and we built classroom. On the right you see where what used to be called the cooking house, the cook case on the right, the children get their food. Left bottom is the new cook case, cooking house that we also managed to build. And right bottom, children now sitting in a brand new classroom. Uh, there's the, that's where the food used to be prepared under that little aftaki as they call it. And that's what uh, Simeon Base used to produce at the bottom. I didn't finish talking about that aerial photography, the photograph. No more. This, these carrots were produced by Simeon. There we were walking through his lands and he's showing me what all he's planning there. Because of water problems now, it's been incredibly dry and the springs are virtually dried and the underwater, uh, underground water is gone. So the farming activity has virtually come to a standstill. Children, perceptions, uh, one student had a project where she worked with the children, got the very young ones to draw, got the older ones to, to write. And they love the place, the young one, their farm. This is their land. And every time they draw, in my time, electricity came to Baystor for the first time. As you can see some of these pictures, always there's a, a light bulb. Suddenly there's a light bulb in the house. And very often they draw the mountain. It's the sun. It's the mountain, it's electricity, it's the place. This is our place. And it's depicted by these very young children. This, these are the perceptions. And then the problems, as I said, hypertension, diabetes, and land claims causing a lot of stress. The realities of HIV and these other, these other problems, uh, virtually every time I come there or by imitation, we have a funeral. I just I have a stack of these funeral notices. You, do, you can see three of them. They're very elaborate. They, they like doing it in a proper way with these colored pictures and everything else. And then a little sad uh, indication, left-hand corner, next to that pebble, you can see uh, the pattern of a clay pot. Clay pot indicating or confirming the fact of a presence of other people who made clay pots, not the base people. Yes, the Sarakalala. That is also stressful. We versus them. This is what they say. This is what outsiders write. The village where Farwood spirit lives on. Constitution obliges black to live in mud houses. There is a small settlement, Talane, in one corner of base. These people are the laborers. But by virtue, the plas, the farm, they are farm laborers. But those people are not claiming they're permanent. That's, that's actually their land, although they have the status of farm laborers. So that's also massive, massive tension. And this is what the, the media says. So they're very allergic to people coming into the community, um, even anthropologists initially, because what are you going to say or write about us? That is what we're asking. We don't oppress black workers, so they're based all prisoners. And then last, those shoes are Simeon Basis, incidentally, just making a little comment on, on the theme of, of today's talk. Bas, a grenzer on Willem Anker. He got, I guess, a, is an Afrikaans a professor at Stellenbosch, got massive recognition for this book, Bas, called it a grenzerman, a frontier uh, novel. Um, Every possible literary accolade he got, massive amounts of money, and wrote this, and it centers around one uh, individual, Kunrad de Base. But not once, and I'll say this here publicly, not once did he go to the base contemporary people, discuss these plans, the fact that he wants to write about this very important 
maybe semi-mythical figure, but sim subliminally, this is what bass is all about, Kunrad the bass, and this is what he did. And he depicts him as, as something else. Thank you. We have time for questions. May I just a practical, a practical matter? People, because we didn't have stock, uh, I asked people to indicate uh, whether we can help them. Uh, Bottega or Bottega, B-O-T-T-E-G-A. Uh, I don't know which book you want. If you can just come and add that to your, uh, also, Brian King. I don't know which book you, you indicated. I presume it's what I need to be sure. Uh, and then there's R-A-D-E, Rade. Uh, I can't quite make out your email, sorry. I've been, I've been, I've been reading student stuff for forever, so I can read anything, but I can't read this. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. Questions? Yes? This? Lots of, many communities. Slang Refere, you mentioned, we discussed, you know, the one that you're working in, uh, certainly based or effectively overnight now, they lost the autonomy. Not that it's accepted or recognized. The base people still function with their management committee. They decide on affairs within that. And if the municipality or the local government wants to come in or interfere, there's always this friction and, and uh, ambivalence as it was. But basically, and by legislation, they now fall under Lutricha. And those people can say, I think they're playing it um, carefully that particular local government, because they don't want to, to have all their attention focused on them. They're fighting with the name anyway, most of the time, Lutrichad Makada, Lutrichad Matkada, and other problems within the town and townships. So the base are, they're about uh, 68 kilometers out of Lutrichad, so in a sense they, they, they let them be. But effectively they've lost their autonomy. All of these places have lost their autonomy. Urania, that exclusive village also runs its own affair, and only because Kimberley says, let's not, let's, let's not, let's not, you know, stir this hornet's nest. Just let them be. The shocking thing for the Rania, this last election, because they have their own little election and ballots and everything there, but they have to, because of the national uh, imperative, they have to vote and send somebody to Kimberley. The shocking thing was when they, when they counted the votes, they took a ballot, there were two votes for the ANC. <laughs> now they're all walking around the town in the shop. They're genetically very, very sim similar. There's slight nuances of difference, but yes. Well, let, me, let me give you the answer, yes. But in terms of subsistent patterns, there's a distinct difference. And then, of course, the language. They share the cliques, but the language is fairly distinct. And there's speculation. The, the San or the Bushmen are smaller in stature, but that, they say, derives from the uh, diet and the way of life versus more sedentary or cattle-oriented, like, taller sort of people. The answer is basically yes. Yes, sir? Uh, just on that point, I mean, the linguists are saying today there's no Bushmen language. They actually don't cross over that is still that debate is still rife. Not not only linguists and anthropologists, but uh, 
except for the except for the geneticists. Only the geneticists agree in terms of that. The the argument is that they they they're not distinct at all. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's not the end of the debate, as, as you indicated. Yes, sir. In, in the testing that you do for DNA, can you tell at all whether there's more sand or more copper? Yeah, they do. They they do percentages. Uh, but they're very careful geneticists are what they're now saying mostly like in the case there's, there's a trace of i didn't go into this too much but uh, the genealogy that, that we did for the base genetic analysis the, the y chrome and male line very west european in fact there's a particular allele a very rare one that you only find in france which is nice oh jean de Boer, thank you for bringing that allele to south africa uh, on the female side is much more diverse but there's also san and koi in their descent yeah they do they can and they they do percentages but usually the pe percentage and they still the geneticists even if i may say my geneticists use the word kusan and then they say 78 percent kusan they don't say koi and son last question I'm, i've been put on terms i need to finish <laughs> In Last music, two questions, sorry. The music of the koi in the sun, is that preserved at all? <coughs> yeah. David Kramer, you've heard of him? He went traveling uh, and found Kariki people uh, who still have a kind of, with a ramki, a homemade guitar and that. And about, amongst the, the, the descendants of the koi particularly, they still have a, a kind of music. What I won't say is that this is koi music, but it's a particular kind of music that must have been influenced because of where they came from. Last question. This must be the last question. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Only recently, after 94, a lot of bases moved out to Botswana and other places because they felt uncomfortable for whatever reason. As I said, they weren't white enough before, and then they felt they weren't black enough. But they came back, and they are back. They live, and they were from Botswana and Zimbabwe. They come and Namibia. Their bases all over the place. These bases. But in the 19th century, with the cattle moving out of South Africa, did the, the Some did. follow on? Oh yeah. Time. Oh yeah. In fact, the so-called white bases from these bases in Namibia moved before that even migrated to Namibia and other places. Thank you, everybody.